You can hear me well? Everything is good? The audio? Yep, all good. All good. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the fourth episode of Conceptualism. Today, we have with us Duke Eatman, who is a broadcaster uh, from Montreal, um, the winner of the Anglophile Personality Year of the uh, Award, um, and, uh, and a Prince aficionado. Thank you so much for being here with us, Duke. Brother Afraz, it's an honor and a pleasure, pleasure and a privilege. I love what it is that you're doing, and I think what you're doing is important, especially in the times that we're living in now. And it's just a privilege to be with you here today to talk about music and art and all those things. Well, thank you. I, I mean, I, I've been reading. I've been reading that that uh, you know you um, that you are an expert in so many different kinds of music, whether it's rock, whether it's jazz, uh, you know, uh, whether it's hip hop. You seem to have your finger on the pulse, you know, with with all these musical genres, which is which is remarkable. You know, you, you seem to have a very eclectic taste. Well, I thank you so much for the compliment. I don't know if I'm an expert. I know I'm passionate about all forms of music. I grew up listening to all sorts of music, but that's also due to the era that I came from as well. Mm -hmm. I came from a unique era that built people that could be into different forms and styles of music. I don't know if we necessarily live in that era now. We might be returning to it in some ways, but there was a gap in between, um, I would say, that started at some point in the late 70s and continued on for a couple of decades where everything became genre driven, mm -hmm. where everything became FM rock radio, urban radio, AM uh, oldies hits radio, talk radio. You go into uh, record stores and then you, you go through um, aisles where, you know, hip hop and R&B and, and I understand the, the reason and the need to identify these things. And I'm not saying that the whole, the whole aspect of separating genres and record stores is new. But like, for instance, when I was young, you know, in the top 10, you could have the Jackson 5, uh, the Beatles, Helen Reddy, uh, Joe Cocker, Ike and Tina Turner, Otis Redding, Wilson Pickett, Jim Croce, Seals and Croft, and Frank Sinatra, all in the top 10 on any given week. Yeah. And, and, and not just that, but all their individual listeners would also at least embrace half or three quarters of the other songs as well also. Mm -hmm. It was a time where good music was just good music and it was very varied and that continued. And then for all sorts of reasons, probably most of it financially driven, that changed in the 70s. And then things became very segregated. For instance, when MTV launched in 1981, MTV wasn't playing music by any artist of color, period. They were only playing white pop and rock artists and their music videos and rejecting anything that didn't fit into that category. Hmm. So at one point they were trying to get uh, Epic Records, which was owned by CBS, which today is under the umbrella of Sony Music, mm -hmm. was trying to get MTV to play Michael Jackson's Billie Jean video. And they said, we don't play that sort of music here. That's not our demographic. And so CBS basically told them, well, if you don't play Michael Jackson, we're not sending you Bruce Springsteen's latest video. We're not sending you uh, this latest video. And we're not giving you any of our videos. And then Warner Brothers acted the same way when they wouldn't play Prince's Little Red Corvette. They said, well, we won't send you this. We won't send you that. So there was like a coup on behalf of the record labels to promote these artists that forced MTV to incorporate that. And then eventually what became the most popular and played videos on MTV eventually became hip hop and rap videos by black artists to begin with. The most famous segment on MTV at one point was Yo MTV Raps hosted by Ed Lover and Dr. Dre, not that Dr. Dre, but another Dr. Dre, the original Dr. Dre of uh, Westbury, New York. And that became the MO of music videos and that whole culture. But wow. before that, it was a very segregated 
era. And I happened to be born at the tail end of the 1960s. And I was fortunate enough to be in an era where there was room for the kids group, the Jackson Five on the charts, where there was room for the old guy, Phil Collins on the charts, where was the room for Run DMC, Michael Jackson, Prince, Madonna, and then uh, old groups uh, like Dire Straits or the Eagles that just happened to make a record that young people went to. Today, you don't see that as much in regards to um, top 40 radio being age friendly, meaning playing music across age spectrums. Um, it seems that the radio today or top 40 radio is geared to people 25 and under. But the positive aspect that's coming out of that is that we're seeing more and more of the lines being blurred as far as genres go. And that's a positive thing because you're finding more and more artists that somebody might identify as a hip hop artist and they don't really consider themselves a hip hop artist. Somebody might consider another group a rock artist. They don't really consider themselves a rock artist and they're blurring the lines. That's something that happened in the nineties and it's continuing now. And I think it's a positive thing because genres are just for identification purposes, really um, to be connected with marketing promotion, right? which is just financially driven. That's the only, you know, and I'm sure there's a political aspect of it and there's a whole racist aspect of it as well. Mm -hmm. For instance, you had FM rock radio that started in the early seventies. So they were playing rock groups with songs that weren't necessarily singles. These are the stations that would play things like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath, but there were black rock bands and they weren't playing black rock bands, but yet it was the exact same type of music that they were trying to promote. So there was a political aspect to it as well, not just financial, because music fans at the end of the day, just like good music. Right. Right. Um, if you're really, really a fan of music, you don't really care the color of the artist or their background or ethnicity or whatnot, excuse me. <coughs> you just enjoy good music. Yeah. So I was fortunate enough to come from an era where for about 10, 15 years, those lines were blurred, maybe even about 10 years. And so I'm the product of that, where I love Santana. I love Public Enemy. I love uh, D'Angelo. Um, I love whatever's good music. It, it doesn't have to be from a, from a particular era. It doesn't have to be from a particular genre. <coughs> Excuse me. And it doesn't have to necessarily be um, from a, a particular type of artist. I just like what I like. Well, that's amazing. That's, that's, uh, you know, it's quite interesting because that's, that's how I think about music as well Is you know, I'm not really looking, uh, I'm not really looking at it in terms of genres or in terms of, you know, the ethnicity of the artist or, you know, or that kind of thing. I'm looking at it as in terms of is, is it valuable as, as a, as an emotional, intellectual, artistic statement? That's, that's, Absolutely. Really the, that's the criteria. And, um, you know, actually, I, I wanted to bring up uh, somebody that was born in Montreal and, you know, who really shaped the music world in, in, in so many ways. And that's Oscar Peterson, you know, yeah. he, who's a hero of mine. And, um, and, you know, so in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of people discriminating against, you know, artists of color and things like that, uh, there's, there's a famous story where, um, uh, where Oscar Peterson, you know, after a concert, he was, you know, meeting the fans. And one of his fans was a white man who came up to him and said, listen, uh, I love your music. I think you're the best jazz pianist in the world, but I can't shake your hand because you're black, you know? Yeah, that's a and, true story. And, and uh, go ahead. And what a lot of people might not be aware of is the reason why Oscar Peterson got so big in the United States is because, believe it or not, um, there was more places for him to play in the United States than there was in his hometown here in Montreal. And, you know, the United States had what was called, known as the Chitlin Circuit, which is at least this whole circuit of nightclubs and venues where Black artists could play. And Montreal had one venue that was part of the Chitlin Circuit, which was Rockheads. But for the most part, um, Oscar Peterson experienced even more racism in Montreal 
uh, than he would in certain parts of the United States. And this is why he was embraced. Duke Ellington called him the Maharaja of the piano. Yes. That was his nickname. Yes. And I remember hearing stories of um, Aretha Franklin waking up at her home as a child and teenager in Detroit and hearing piano playing in the living room. And she'd go downstairs and realize that's when Oscar was in town. He was a young prodigy uh, touring around the States. And, you know, oftentimes black artists couldn't stay in hotels and those sort of things. So they were actually put up by other black prominent families or whatnot. And Oscar Peterson used to stay at her house uh, with her father, the Reverend C.L. Franklin. And she would wake up. It could be, I don't know, Sunday morning, Saturday morning, go downstairs and, you know, uh, 19, 20 year old Oscar Peterson is on the piano. And it seemed like everybody in the neighborhood dropped by just to hear him play. That's a true story. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. And he was so important <clears throat> to so many people for so many different things. But um, he's also a reminder of uh, the stain of racism and discrimination, which was a part of the fabric of Canada at the time. And it's still a part of the fabric till this day yeah. that people like to forget about. Oh, no. Not Canada. Canada's not like that. <clears throat> you know, Canada's where uh, African Americans escaped to through the Underground Railroad to escape slavery. Well, a lot of black people that came to Canada, a lot of them end up going back to the States because they felt the harsh treatment here was worse than the harsh treatment that they were suffering in the southern part of the United States. Um, and we also had slavery right here in Canada as well, especially in the eastern, the east coast part of this country. But you know, he persevered and it was his love for his art and his music that allowed him to rise above that and to not allow discrimination and racism stop him and eventually be considered one of the greatest men to ever tickle the ivories in the history of the instrument itself. And, and of course, uh, you know, if we're talking about Oscar Peterson, we have to talk about Art Tatum. Oh, Art Tatum, probably Oscar Peterson's hero. That's right. That's there, right. There, was, there was so many great musicians from that era, especially those that came out of the bebop era. I was a big fan of Art Tatum, but I was also a huge fan of Bud Powell and the eccentric approach that he had to music. And you listen to the really eccentric styles of Thelonious Monk. Yes. But I was, I was in a record shop once and somebody brought up, they said, as much as he plays those broken chords and has that eccentric sound, you notice he's never off time. And if you listen to any of his records, he's never off time. His timing is impeccable, as strange as his music may sound at times. There was incredible musicians that played the piano during that era of the jazz bebop era, so many. Absolutely. Um, and, and, uh, and also, you know, um, speaking of the, the jazz era and speaking about artists that have, you know, um, done, done a lot of work, you know, crossing genres, you know, uh, Miles Davis obviously comes to mind and, and also people like, like Herbie Hancock, you know. Um, Absolutely. I interviewed Herbie Hancock a couple of years ago. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. First, let me just touch on Miles. Miles Davis is what jazz is all about. He is jazz. Um, <laughs> Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington were as well. Yeah. I mean, if you ask Miles Davis, you know, what, what's, what's the two people that define jazz? He said Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong. But Miles Davis was somebody whose music continued to evolve um, into the fusion period of the early 70s, albums like Bitches Brew, evolving into uh, the funk era, Get on a Corner, and then eventually he started experimenting with, you know, synthesizers and the modern sounds of the 80s on albums like uh, Tutu and You're Under Arrest. And then his last album, which was produced by Easy Mo B, who's a legendary hip hop producer from another group called R.I.P. Rapping is Fundamental. His last album, the Doobop album, was a hip hop jazz album. And, you know, a lot of jazz artists used to have a problem with Miles of, of him straying from the music as far as they thought he was. And, you know, he, he said he was never a jazz artist. He's just an artist, just a musician. And he goes where the music takes him. Even Duke Ellington was ahead of his time. He stopped the labels of genres at an early point in his career. He says, you know, we use the term jazz because it's been around so long, it wouldn't make sense not to use it. But he said, in reality, there's only two types of music, good music and bad music. <laughs> and so 
these these artists were cutting edge, but there were other artists that thought he was being sacrilegious with where he was going and what he was doing. And really, you know, that's what music is. It's something that evolves and you follow the voice. And you know, it's okay for people that don't want to evolve, that want to continue doing the same thing because they have a love for what it is that they're doing. But we need to not hate on folks that want their music to go somewhere else. I mean, life is what it is. At 51, I'm certainly not what I was at 41, and I'm certainly not what I was at 31. We, we change, we go through life. The essence of who we are as people, we hope remains intact if we're good people. But it's the way that we express that goodness in our spirit and soul that evolves and changes over time. Yes, and, 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 and you know, I think that, that evolution or that, that change is, is, uh, is healthy and, it's, and it's, it's, it's necessary even. And, and I don't think, I, don't think, I mean, a, a lot of purists will say, you know, oh, you know, you, you, shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't do things that are cross genre or, you know, uh, interdisciplinary or, you know, think, things that are not in the box. Uh, right. But if, if, if everybody did that, then it wouldn't be a very interesting, it wouldn't be a very interesting scene. You know, and 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 I think I think it would actually it would actually hinder the development of uh, of 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 music really. So you know, so for me actually, it's got it's gotten to the point where uh, I I'm actually willing to you know to hash it out with purists. So I present a series called Purists Beware. You know, I love that. So so I I think what Miles was doing was actually not even sacrilegious. I think I think I think it actually it actually allowed jazz to breathe. You know, it I think what he what he was doing was what he was supposed to be doing. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Think about it. What is a purist? Okay. So some people say a purist was somebody from the bebop era. Okay. Mm -hmm. But artists from the bebop era were looked at as maniacs from artists from the big band era. Right. And then the, okay? the same thing with the Dixieland era and, and going back. You understand what I mean? So who's purist? You're only pure for your time the only person that's a purist is the first person to never play music and i don't think he ever made a record so we can't really tell <laughs> <laughs> but what, what is pure for instance you mentioned prince earlier what kind of artist is prince well he i mean he's he's definitely you can't put him in a box i mean he's made can't. He's, he's made heavy metal albums he's made, made jazz albums he's made uh, hip hop album. I mean, he's he's done it all. He's done it all. I mean, he, he's he's done it all. So yeah. all you can say is Prince's music. What kind of music? Music. Yeah, good music. Good music. Yes. He, I mean, he would fall under what Duke Ellington called his good music. Right, because you see, I mean, like the, he was doing a, a a series of concerts with just him at the piano. Oh and yeah. Like, and and people don't realize this, but Prince actually had chops on the keyboard. Like he could actually play. It was his number one instrument, by the way. People are not aware of that before guitar. Right. Most experts would agree, as great as he was as a guitarist and a bass player and drummer and whatnot, he was most proficient on a keyboard. He was dangerous on a keyboard. His father was a, was a jazz pianist as well, but he was very dangerous on the keyboard. And he even said at the beginning of those concerts, uh, uh, Prince of Piano and a Microphone, that he was very nervous because he said he had never done this for an entire concert. He always had that piano interlude solo thing for about 15, 20 minutes yeah. in his shows throughout his career. But he said to actually sit down for an hour and a half and just strip down every song he's ever done, playing it in piano. He said it was a challenge, but he said he welcomed it. And he said that was making yourself most um, vulnerable. Mm. You know, when Doves Cry with his production and lack of, of a bass line and synthesizers and guitar effects, incredible vocals and all these things sounds great. But now, if you listen to him sit down at a piano and play it, you forget the production. You realize what a great song it is. And that was the challenges of his last tour, of which his second to last of those piano and microphone tours was in Montreal. He only played one more city after Montreal before he left us, which was Atlanta. But um, I also noticed, like you mentioned artists, and you know a lot of these artists, and I can name some more as well, they have this deep admiration and fascination for each other. And at first glance, they don't seem to be related musically in any way, shape or form. So if you take Miles Davis, Prince, even the political hip hop group, Public Enemy, 
folk legend and jazz legend, Joni Mitchell. People like Herbie Hancock, which I'll tell you about that interview in a minute. And uh, Tower of Power, James Brown. These are artists from all very different cities, yet they all had an admiration and fascination with themselves. Prince was a huge Joni Mitchell fan. Joni Mitchell was a huge Miles Davis fan. Yeah. A lot of people might have a hard time connecting those dots. Isn't, isn't there, isn't there, there uh, I think there's a story where uh, Prince used to write Joni Mitchell fan mail and, uh, and, and yeah. appar apparently the, uh, the people that read her fan mail thought it was some lunatic writing to her because he used to like do the eyes with little hearts on them and stuff like that. They thought he was some kind of dying. Right, just like, just like he would later on. Absolutely. Well, you know, before Prince died, a couple of years before, he had this house in um, Beverly Hills that he called 3121. And he used to organize these concerts. So it'd be an award show, so he'd get his band, he'd get the time, which was a protege band of his. He'd recruit people from the roots. He'd grab Stevie Wonder. He'd grab this person, that that person, and says, we're doing, we're doing a jam at my house. So you got some of the greatest musicians on the planet meeting at Prince's Mansion for a jam session. And the audience is Joni Mitchell, sitting by a fireplace watching. That was the audience. He would gather these incredible artists and jam. And like Questlove of the Roots said, not just like a jam, like this was the jam of the century. And Joni Mitchell would be sitting by the fireplace watching this. And you're figuring, how do the Roots, Joni Mitchell, Prince, Stevie Wonder, I, it's because I think that musicians who are very passionate about what it is that they do are very passionate about other people. Bruce Lee was a huge Muhammad Ali fan. Even though Bruce Lee's form of martial arts was very different than boxing, is because he admired the gallantry and he admired the greatness of what Muhammad Ali did. Yes. And you'll find that a lot. People that seem worlds apart might be worlds apart in their narrative, but they're connected spiritually because they're masters at what they do and they admire each other's dedication. Yes. Yeah. Herbie Hancock, I had the chance to interview two years ago. And I had been a Herbie Hancock fan since I was young. I actually used to use his song Chameleon as a theme song for another radio show I used to do. And I was a fan of everything that he did, fan of his work with Miles Davis. His fan, I was a fan of his when he started experimenting with hip hop, like with Rocket, with uh, Graham Mix of DST scratching on his record in the early 80s and whatnot. And the funny thing about it, was once he left Miles Davis and he got into more funk oriented stuff, like on albums like Headhunters and all that, right? They said that Herbie Hancock sold out, but I told him this, I said, but sell out, you never liked jazz to begin with. And he started laughing, he said, exactly. He said, what was I selling out? I was never a jazz fan. Before Miles, I had almost zero interest in jazz. I was into whatever. I was into just whatever, but I certainly wasn't a jazz purist guy. So he says, I was already into like funky stuff and soul and doo-wop and rock and roll and this sort of thing. So when I left Miles and I went to the electric thing, I just went back to further experimentation with stuff that I already was a fan of way before I got into the jazz thing. A lot of people may not know this, but prior to his work with Herbie Hancock, Jazz was not something that Herbie Hancock was looking to get into. And Herbie Hancock won a Grammy Award in 2009, I think it was, for doing an album, doing jazz renditions of Joni Mitchell songs. You see how it's all, right? Like how it's all intertwined? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a tapestry. And there, there's all these threads and people don't really see that actually these threads are all woven together to create that picture. I've sat down with Chuck D, who's been my business partner for over 20 years, and we've discussed nothing but Lennon and McCartney songs. Okay. You figure, Duke Eman, Chuck D, The Beatles, huh? One of Chuck D's favorite groups is The Beatles. One of his favorite songwriting teams is John Lennon and Paul McCartney. And we went to dinner just discussing all their great songs and how they differ and whatnot. We talked hip hop. Yeah. Yes. And we talked to Beatles because at the end of the day, quality work is quality work. 
Yeah. Yeah, Chuck D is a huge Beatles fan. Well, and, and I mean, I, I'm an organist, so I want to talk about uh, two organists that, that are, the, well, of course, Jimmy Smith, and, uh, and, and, then, um, and then there's uh, this guy called uh, uh, Dr. Lonnie, uh, mm -hmm. who, who, who I think he actually, he came to Halifax for the Jazz Fest, and, 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 and yeah, it was remarkable. He played the Hammond B3 uh, through, I think, three Leslie speakers, um, and, uh, and, and he had a synthesizer, and it was, I mean, it was probably the funkiest, like, organ music I've ever heard, and, and just unbelievable. You know, um, Jimmy is probably the master of the Hammond B3, which, when it was introduced in the late 50s and early 60s, became an instrument within itself, a precursor to the synthesizers. And yes, you had to be a good keyboard player to play the Hammond B3, but being a good keyboard player alone wasn't going to do it for you. Right. Because you really had to learn how to take control of those keys. You had to learn to play against a Leslie speaker that's built within the Hammond B3 organ. And it became an instrument unto itself. And just, you know, so many great people have played it, but Jimmy Smith, I remember one of the first instrumental albums I ever had was one of his albums in the early 70s called Respect. What Jimmy Smith used to do is he used to take all the top songs of the day, rock songs, soul songs, R&B songs, and do instrumental versions of them on his albums. And basically, instead of the singing, would play the melody over the Hammond B3, but he would do these crazy weird solos over it and everything like that. And he became somebody that became the master of the Hammond B3. And I'm still a sucker for the Hammond B3 organ till this very day because there's just something about its richness, its thickness, this really kind of psychedelic vibe that it brings, this very church-like soulful vibe that it brings also. Yeah. And it's those that know how to master it. Prince was an incredible Hammond B3 organ player as well. And he started introducing it to his fans on the Sign of the Times album. And um, it's just an incredible instrument amongst itself. And I'm so glad that it became revived because it's just one of the most unique sounding keyboards ever. And, and I know that some synths have come close to duplicating the sound, but nobody will ever 100% duplicate that sound of the Hammond B3 organ being played through the Leslie speaker, which has the fan going inside it to give it that cut off type thing. Just incredible. I love it. I'm a, I'm a sucker for a Hammond B3. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's actually, it's a, it's a horn and it rotates, it spins around. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and it's, and, and you can control the speed of it as well. So you can go from slow to fast and back to slow. Yeah. Yeah. You really got to understand that instrument. I mean, it helps if you're a good keyboardist to begin with, Yeah. but that alone won't do it. You yeah. really got to understand this instrument. And you know, actually, the, the Hammond... It, they make a Hammond B3 synth. Like, ha Hammond actually makes a, a synth. And it's close to it. Yeah. If you really know the instrument, you can tell the difference. Right, right. And, and, and you know, actually, it's quite interesting that, that the Hammond was actually an emulation. It was like a budget version of a pipe organ. Because, you know, not every church can afford a pipe organ. So the Hammond was actually made as an alternative. Absolutely was made as an alternative to that. Absolutely. And now and now it's like it's, Absolutely. it's an irreplaceable yeah. instrument unto itself. And like you said it it ha it now has a life of its own. Yeah. And 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 I mean it's yeah. just amazing to think that this was the budget version of a pipe organ and now now it's like like now now you can't imagine rock pop funk music without an organ without without uh, without the B3, you know? Cuz it's it, it's just We don't we can't even call it an organ anymore because it could be confused with something else. It's the Hammond B3. That's you know right. what I mean? Yeah. But that era was the most exciting era for keyboards prior to synthesizers because then you also had the Fender Rhodes electric piano. Yes. Which is very distinct and unique in itself. Yeah. You had the Wurlitzer organ, which was very cool. And also what I'm noticing a revival with recently, and I'm sure you've seen this, um, kind of like the Hammond B3 in the late 80s saw its revival. We're seeing a revival of the Melo the Mellotron. The Mellotron, recently. yes, yeah. And yeah. everyone's wanting to get one and use one. And it's like people from the sixties are like, huh? You got synthesizers. What do you want those for? They were the original synthesizers. The Mellotron's making a big comeback. Yeah. 
big comeback. It was, um, I think maybe the earliest song I ever heard using Mellotron was uh, the intro to Strawberry Fields Forever by the Beatles. That was um, just a unique sound. It's, uh, I love I wish I owned a Mellotron. <laughs> well, and, and, and you know, actually, th this, this brings me to something interesting, which is that the first synthesizer was actually the pipe organ, you know, because- Oh yeah, I, for sure. The pipe organ was the first instrument that, that could emulate other voices or other sounds, you know? Absolutely. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. And then, you know, the things like the Moog and all that stuff, that was just a later development. Did you know that the Beatles used the Moog on both uh, Abbey Road and Let It Be? Wow. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah. It definitely doesn't surprise that's me. That's the early mono, the, the early mono Moogs. Right. I have a Yamaha DS, I'm trying to remember. No, a Yamaha CS10. Okay. It's in my room. It's a big Yamaha. It's Yamaha's answer to the early mono Moogs with 10 million knobs to change the modulation frequencies and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, if you like things like uh, the Chronic, Dr. Dre, or the songs that were sampling like Leon Haywood's I Wanna Do Something Freaky, it's got all those sounds on there. Yeah. You know, that real G-Funk type thing. And those were early precursors. And I mean, today, you, you, can, have a, you can have a keyboard this big today. <laughs> and it's all there for you. I, I've got this little guy back here and-, and um, Actually, yeah. This this keyboard it has some history, man. You know, the the first time that I played it out in public was with my high school jazz band uh for the for the so I, I played a solo on Chameleon uh uh by Herbie Hancock. Herbie I, Hancock. Yeah. I played I played this keyboard. I in fact, what I did was I attached guitar straps to it, so I made it a guitar. So I was Ah, you, you made your own guitar. <laughs> And and uh, and I was playing this, you know, this solo over over Chameleon, and the adjudicator, uh, the adjudicator loved it. But he, he said, he, he, after my, after the band finished playing, he said, "Who's the most annoying person in the band?" And the whole band pointed to me. So <laughs> they mean the most innovative, the most adventurous. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the keyboard has just been an incredible instrument. And although I started playing guitar before keyboards. I have a special relationship with keyboards because I mean, it's, it's all out there for you. Like if you think of the guitar, I mean, just your average, typical average six string tuning of guitar, it makes no logical sense. Whoever thought to create this said, how can I make a musician's life hard? Oh, I know I'll invent the guitar. Whereas the keyboard it's there. It's all there in front of you. Yeah. It's all there. Right. From, from a, to G flat, it's all there chronologically. Now it's up to you how you're going to tackle that. Duke Ellington used to call music um, mathematical problems, right? And composing was just trying to figure out these mathematical problems, trying to solve them. Right, right. And well, that's that's really what you're doing with music. Well, you know, this is the thing you, you, you bring up like that the keyboard has this setup, right? And but but as you know, you know, in the olden days, uh, when I say the olden days, like, you know, in the 15th century, the 14th century, you know, um, the, the tunings that they had for the instrument were not standardized, that there was mean tone tuning, there was, you know, there was all kinds of different ways of tuning the instrument. So, uh, so, you know, today, those are called historical temperaments. So today, you know, the, the, the piano um, is tuned to a 440. But you know, there's people that, that, that want to tune sharp. There's people that want to tune flat. So even though there, of course, there's a standard, you know, like, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of La Monty Young. He's uh, an experimental uh, music composer um, who tuned the piano microtonally. And, 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 and then the, the entire tuning of the piano was completely changed. So it, you, I mean, it sounds like a piano, but it also sounds nothing like a piano. So uh, so there, there, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of uh, weird things that, that that have been done in terms of tuning on the keyboard. The capo Even, on a I've never used. The... Go ahead. That's really interesting because you make me think of like when guitarists use a capo. Now I've never used a capo in my life, and I've never understood why I would want to use one. But there are guitarists that never play without one. Right. And so. Yeah, I guess, you know, there is musicians that want things tuned a certain way other than the standard. Yes. 
And I mean, it works for what they're doing. There's no right or wrong way. It's, it's your voice. But I remember Dizzy Gillespie when I think Miles Davis, I don't remember he was referring to Quincy Jones or Miles Davis, but he was trying to explain something musical to them when they were young. And he said, to understand jazz or all music, you need to learn to play the piano a little bit because it's all there for you. He says, I could better explain to you what it is that I do on trumpet on the piano. He says, because it's all there for you. You can, you can see. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I guess that's how my approach is. I wasn't aware that uh, keyboards hundreds of years ago were tuned in different ways. I really had no idea. I had no idea. And so, you know, it goes to show you that uh, every, every musician is different or can be different. That's right. That's right. And, and, and even, even today, like, um, like, you know, we have these uh, pitch bend wheels and modulation wheels and things, and you can, you can, you can affect the way that the, the pitch is. So like you, like with analog synthesizers, for example, right. you know, there's all these in between notes that, that, that can be used. And of course, like with Indian music, you know, there's microtones, there's all the, the notes in between the notes, you know, cause in between, absolutely. Each note, in between each note, there's all that space in between. So like, for example, if you're playing a sitar or a vena, right? Uh, these are the string instruments. Uh, they, they, they can play all these in between notes, which, um, which a lot of like a lot of people in the West are now trying to emulate. So one of the things that people do to customize their guitars is they use scalloped frets. Like they, they uh, there's a guy called, um, uh, what's his name? How am, I, how am I blanking on this? The guitar, John McLaughlin. Who, who plays yeah. a guitar, who plays a guitar that has scalloped frets. So instead of bending the note by pulling the string up or down, you bend it by pushing it in, which is, which is the way it's done with Indian music, which is the way it's done with the sitar and the veena. You know? Uh, so uh, so it's, it's not just- it's good music since I was really young and obviously been a big fan of Ravi, Ravi Shankar. Yes. And I used to notice that a lot of the notes that he used to play in some of the ragas sounded exactly like the way a note would sound when you would bend a string doing a blues solo or exactly. playing blues scales. Yes, yeah. And it was exactly those notes that you need to almost go in between the two notes to get that sound. And the difference with the sitar is that you would see, uh, uh, you would see, I would see Ravi Shankar maybe press on a string and a blues guitarist or rock guitarist would basically have to pull or a broader on the string and get those type of notes that are in between. Yeah. But if you ever have the opportunity one day, listen to Ravi Shankar and listen to a musician like B.B. King or even Albert King, and you're going to hear a lot of the same notes and tonality played. Yes. And it always sounded like a lot of the scales were, were very, very similar. But I've always called Indian has those sounds that you won't hear in other forms of music. Yeah, no, there's, a, like you said, you know, the, the masters, the great masters of, 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 of their art, that there, there are these parallels that, that can be drawn. And, and when you listen carefully, uh, you know, it's, it's remarkable, the, 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 you know, the similarities, you know, between these musical forms that are worlds apart, and yet somehow they, they make perfect sense together. Like, can you imagine if B.B. King was jamming with Ravi Shankar? Like, it would- Ravi Shankar was a big jazz fan. Yeah, no, he was exactly, and so Ravi, Ravi Shankar. He with the Ravi Beatles. Shankar got picked up by George Harrison, who right. who he had given sitar lessons to from the Beatles. Right, he had given George Harrison sitar lessons, yeah. and he went to pick him up at the airport, and he was playing something in the car, and he said, "Who is that?" And he said, "Oh, it's nothing. I'll stop it." He goes, "It's um, uh, um, Cab Calloway in his orchestra." He says, "Oh, I know Cab Calloway. I used to go see him play at the Apollo in Harlem," and George Harrison looked at him and said. First of all, you know who Cab Calloway is at number two? You came to see him play at the Apollo Theater in Harlem? He couldn't understand that Ravi Shankar's musical interests stretched like that. But masters recognize each other. Yes. I agree. I agree 100%. 100%. And, you know, it's also true that, like, um, like you know, like people across genres will, will see each other and, and realize, okay, this person is doing something remarkable. I'll work with them. Like, for example, Kent Nagano, who's the conductor of the OSM, and, uh, and Frank Zappa, 
right? Like Frank Zappa reached out to Kent Nagano and said, I want you to conduct my work, um, you know? And, and of course, Kent Nagano like, oh, right. it's this, it's this rock star, you know, who's making, who's trying to make classical music. And he's like, you know, I'm not really sure. Frank Zappa is like, you got 10 seconds. If you don't decide in 10 seconds, I'm, I'm ditching you. I'm, I'm going to pick someone else. So thankfully, uh, Kent Nagano said, yes, I'll do it. And so, you know, they ended up making history and recording with the London Symphony Orchestra and, uh, yeah, it was just remarkable. But Frank Zappa started in classical, but Frank Zappa started in classical music. That's right. So, so the very fact, first music that he, he learned to play was classical music, right. self-taught. Then he got into jazz. That's the rock right. thing came later. Kent Nagano had no idea that Frank Zappa was probably based in classical music. Yeah. I've seen Frank Zappa conduct orchestras. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, uh, and, and it's so interesting, you know, that, 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 that at the end of the day, the masters of their craft, they're not pulling from one place. They're, play, they're pulling from many places because yeah. they, 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 recognize, they recognize that knowledge and wisdom, the, it doesn't matter what form or where it comes from. As long as it's beautiful, as long as it's worth incorporating, then why not? Robert Plant of Led Zeppelin, I'm sorry, said that um, all uh, music is is a bunch of beggars and thieves. And we all take something from somewhere else that we admire and we try to put a spin on it to make it our own. But really, we're all vagabonds, beggars and thieves that recognize greatness as we encounter it through life's journey. And we try to 100% original, I doubt it. Yeah, yeah. No, no, Every no. great thing that someone does, they learn part of that great thing from somebody else. That's right. That's right. And that's, and that's why the master relation... The, that's what the makes master, them great. That, that's why the master-apprentice relationship is so important, right? Uh, you know, no, no, matter who, no matter who the masters are, you know, you, you've got to, you know, you've got to, you've got to apprentice under them. I know today that, that, re that relationship is not the same. You know, now we have the high school system, we have the public education system, you know, we have universities and th things are done a bit differently. But I think that historical model of master apprentice is very important. And, and, uh, and, 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 you know, I've tried to follow it. I've tried to find people whose artistic practices I, I respect and then, you know, learn from them and study under them because I, I think that's, that's the best way to learn. You know, to have I love that whole concept that you just said, master apprentice. That's incredible. I love that. Yeah. I love it. Well, I want to I want to tell you uh, a, a, a bit of a funny story. Um, so, you know, at Place mm. des Arts, you know, at Place des Arts, there's the concert hall Maison Symphonique, right? Um, yes. And, and I I went for I went for a concert, uh, a Frank Zappa concert, and uh, after the concert. Mm. I, I, I kind of, uh, I, you know, I, I stayed behind and, and I, and like I hid behind one of the seats. I waited for the whole concert hall to clear out. Then I got out, uh, went onto the pipe organ and started playing on the pipe organ. And, and I recorded the whole thing. So about, no. about, about, about two hours into my playing, the organist for the, for the OSM uh, comes out. And, and he's like, who the hell are you? And why are you playing the pipe organ? <laughs> and, and, and man, that, that was, that, that was, I was, I mean. You're I mean, lying. I'm not lying. I'm not, I'm not. I swear. I, I, I like, I swear I'm not lying. This actually happened. I actually did this. And, and, uh, and he, he was like, you know, he was completely shocked, you know, and, 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 uh, cause I knew if I asked, officially asked, can I play this pipe organ? It would never happen because there's too much bureaucracy. So I said, you know what? I'll take matters into my own hands. I'll just, I'll, I'll go to a concert. I'll stay after of the course. concert and I'll play it. And, and, and I did, and I recorded the whole thing. I still have the whole tape. I still have the whole tape of my whole improvisation there. That's absolutely beautiful. I love that story. You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> man, I you know, I, I, I actually, I actually started. I could have been arrested for that, man. I started I started writing songs, like seriously writing songs when maybe I was about 14, 15. And by the time I was 16, going on 17, I had built a home studio. And I was 
writing and producing and playing all the parts of these songs myself. Most of the time, the drum tracks were programmed on a drum machine. Right. Started off with a Korg and then went to an Elise's. Sometimes live drums. I have a live drum kit. Parts, the bass parts, uh, keyboard parts, guitar parts. Uh, and I would do the backward vocals first, the background vocals first, because I only had a four track. So you're ping ponging and bouncing a lot of, a lot of um, tracks to the point where the, the generational quality just plummets, goes down, you know? And then you do the lead vocal out of necessity because I'd never band at the time. I just had straight musicians that I played with here and there. And then later on, reading that this is how Stevie Wonder recorded, this is how Prince recorded, this is how other musicians that were sort of self-contained in a one-man or one-woman band type thing. And, you know, that really takes the whole creative process upside down because you have a song and you have a vision of it and you have an, an, an audio example of it and you have to find some sort of mathematical way of making it happen and executing it based on your equipment or lack thereof or limited resources. And what I found the challenge was then is keeping that creative masterpiece. And why I say masterpiece is because when you're a teenager, every song you write is a masterpiece and keeping it intact, but executing it to have it mean something else. When I first started, most of the time, the songs would come out completely different than what I had envisioned. And then eventually when you would, um, you know, you improve, you understand things better, you, you learn how to replicate that sound, being a one man band type thing, laying these tracks down, that you learn to bring to fruition a little bit more what you originally set out to be. But that could be a challenge for creativity also from uh, depending on what it is you're doing. And I'm speaking right now from the recording aspect of it. And I listened back to some of these demo tapes, which I still have to this very day, demo tapes done when I was 16 years old. And they were pretty good for a guy that age. And other people told me they were pretty good for a guy that age that had to basically do everything himself. But it was a challenge because when doing it, the challenge was um, to complete it when at times it sounded nothing like the finished product that you had in your head. And so to keep that vision was always a challenge. And I think that's what some of the mathematical problems that Duke Ellington was talking about. He obviously wasn't talking about that because back in those days when you recorded, you recorded live with the full band, full orchestra. Right. You know, right. It wasn't the same type of uh, of issue, but we've um, we've seen more of that. And you know, there are people also that that have access to other musicians to do these things, but do it themselves because it might be something they have an idea for. Like, like I remember the Almond Brothers, one of their classic songs reading about he couldn't find any of the members of the band when he, he broke into a studio at 12 o'clock in the morning because it wasn't open. See, they had time booked in the studio, but the session was over and the song came to him in the middle of the night. And so when he went to record it, it was locked. So he actually had to break the window to break inside. And But now he's got to find ways to lay this, this track down because he can't find any of the other musicians. And you want to sort of record that voice, at least in a rough form, so that the rest of the musicians can hear it, so that they could eventually be able to come in and execute it the way you, you want to. Right. But yeah, art can have its challenges. It and can. can have its mathematical problems that you need to solve. That's right. And, and you know, and when it comes to access, you know, I think, I think people don't understand that as an artist, you have to, you sometimes have to get access to things that you don't necessarily 
they're they're not laid out in front of you, you know. No. Um, and so you have to you have to strive. You have to you have to solve these these problems, you know. Um, and you have to be creative about it. Like you know, this story that I told you about Maison Symphonique, it's not public knowledge. This is actually the first time I've I've spoken about it in public that that I actually did this, you know. You're lucky it wasn't public knowledge. You might have been uh, incarcerated. That's, 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 that's right. That's what I was saying, man. It was like, you know. But, but I think I think the, the, the I'm glad that the organist caught me because now I'm friends with him, uh, you know. And uh, and I think I think. Does he let you go in and play? Sorry. Does he let you go in and play? Oh no! Now I live in Toronto, so so I've got I've got access to all, all kinds of other uh, organs, you know. <laughs> You know, and sometimes even the, that process and those mathematical things can lead to other things. For instance, Stevie Wonder had recorded a demo version of a song, Signed, Sealed, Delivered. Mm -hmm. You familiar with that one? No. Here I am, baby. Oh, signed, sealed, delivered. I'm yours. Barack oh, Obama yes, used it. I do it. know that song. I do know that song. How... Bar yes. Barack Obama used it as his campaign song when he first ran in uh, 2008, right? So at the beginning, there's this lead guitar part that sounds weird. It almost sounds like a sitar. But the reason that it sounds weird is it wasn't meant to be kept on there. It was a guide track for the horns that were supposed to come in on Monday and lay the horn part down. Right. <laughs> so if you ever get a chance, YouTube or listen to it after, and in the beginning... You have this really twangy guitar that sounds like bended notes, and it sounds almost like a sitar. Listen to it, and you'll see. And it goes down, 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 down. It was a guideline for the horns to come in as a horn section and play. Barry Gordy found his way to the Motown studios. Of course, he was the owner and starter, founder of Motown. And he heard this demo tape and decided to release it and press it Monday morning without Stevie knowing, even leaving in that weird guitar guide track, which was for the horn section. And of course, he scored a number one smash seller with that. And the first black president of the United States would use it as his campaign song. So there's musical problems that have to be solved. And then there's musical mistakes that end up becoming masterpieces and being historical. That's right. You would be surprised how many mistakes are in music that become iconic <laughs> and we didn't know they were mistakes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think that's so profound. And I mean, the, the, the most incredible thing, I mean, penicillin was discovered as a mistake. I mean, come on. Like, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Like, like we, we find the most beautiful and remarkable things when we're not even trying. And I think yeah. that, that's, that should tell us something. Yeah. You know, what, 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 what is it? What is it that Quincy Jones says? He says, uh, don't get in your way. Just let God come in the room and do his thing. Don't get in your own creative way. Yeah. Just let God come in and make whatever happens, happens. Right, right. And, and that's what we are. We're really conduits for that higher self, the highest self. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that art and music, a lot of the times is best expressed without meaning to. It just happens. That's a higher power, that's a higher plane, a higher level of consciousness and a higher spirit that's making things happening and using you, like you said, as a conduit and as the vehicle and the vessel for that creativity and that, that, that voice. And um, I, was gonna, I was gonna ask you, um, you, you probably know um, of, of Bobby McFerrin and, and Yo-Yo Ma's collaboration. Um, they, they did a, they did a- um, Oh, one of my favorite collaborations. Album. Yeah, I have them. With, the, with, with Bobby Farron and Yo-Yo Ma playing the cello. And I mean, just absolutely beautiful. And you know, it's funny, so many cellists and different musicians that I've interviewed say that they were just a um, you 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 were breaking up there. Um, sorry, can you just repeat what you said? I said that album was so influential because I've interviewed so many musicians, including cellists and vocalists and whatnot. Yeah. And it's incredible how many I've interviewed that say 
some of their biggest musical influences was those albums that Yo-Yo Ma did with Bobby McFerrin in the mid 80s, late 80s. Right. And I mean, it was just musical worlds that were so different yet came together so harmoniously and created some of the coolest stuff ever. Oh my God, full albums and music together. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely remarkable what they did, and 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 you know, um, I think I think something that I, I I really respect is you know when people when people who are you know uh, who you know are artists from a certain genre like Yo Yo Ma is definitely uh, you know trained in classical music, but like obviously when you look at an ensemble like the Silk Road ensemble, like come on, what genre is that? You know, like, is there a way to even put the right. Silk Road Ensemble into a genre? I don't think there is. And in the same way, you look at what Bobby McFerrin does and, and like, and you look at his way of making music, like beatboxing and, you know, and throat singing and, and just all the different techniques he uses. Uh, you know, what, how do you put that into a genre? You really can't. You know, it's, it's, it's actually, I would like to think of it as an art form unto itself. You know, like it's its, it's, its own thing. It, it, it actually fills its own box. I bet you if you went to Bobby McFerrin's house and went through his record collection, you'd probably find things that would blow you away that you would not picture being in his record collection. That's what creates a type of artist like Bobby McFerrin. Right. Like he's probably, he's probably got everything from Bach to Ethiopian jazz and, and like, and you know, and the, 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 the synthesizer albums. Of from Wendy Kenny Rogers, Rogers to Public Enemy. Yeah, exactly. Like just all kinds of stuff. <laughs> from Kenny like, Rogers to Public Enemy. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's, I, yeah. And, 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 you know, um, I mean, with the internet now, you know, we have access to pretty much all of the world's musical traditions, you know? Um, I mean, even, even, even the traditions that, that weren't, uh, wouldn't have been known publicly 50 years ago because of the internet now, you know, and cell phones and stuff and sort of the, the Democrat, the Democrat, blech, the democratization of, of art, uh, you know, like pretty much anybody can record anything now, you know? Uh, and and so so in that way we we have we have a, a way to peek into the into the musical traditions that that were not public knowledge like for example i'm from tanzania from east africa and so you know um one of the projects that i'm working on is documenting the 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 music of the different tribes you know of of of, of east africa and of tanzania in particular and it's remarkable because each tribe has their own form of dance their own form of music, oh yeah you know and like like in my playing, I'm very influenced by polyrhythms, you know, having like multiple rhythms stacked on top of each other. Like for, for example, you know, you could have something that's in four, four, five, four, and eight, four. And, and it's like all of these things are, are like layered on top of each other. And the way that I learned that is by actually listening to, to you know, the music of, of, of Tanzania, you know, the, the traditional music. Mother Africa is the birthplace of all music and the birthplace of rhythm and sound. Yes. You know, when you describe all these things clashing with each other, you know, you're also describing the music of James Brown. James Brown took us back to Mother Africa with funk, where every instrument that was previously a melodic instrument became a drum. So the bass line wasn't playing a traditional bass fill, it was playing a drum beat. <coughs> the horns were playing drum beats. The guitars were playing drum beats. Yeah. The piano was playing a drum beat. When you listen to his piano solo on Sex Machine, it's not a piano solo, it's a drum beat. When you have that type of rhythmic intersections and interwoven rhythm patterns and time signatures and clashing into each other, but yet all being in time, you have what's known as funk. And that comes from, that comes from Africa. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And even the idea in jazz of playing inside and outside, that's, that's, that's a concept that comes from, from, from African music because- All of it is, but I think where we really started to really embrace African styles was when we got to the bebop era. Right. I think the bebop era went deep into African music. And I think that maybe most of these artists weren't even aware but by virtue of being black artists of African descent, it was in their blood to go back to their place of, of descent. And, you know, you listen to some of these things, you listen to Dizzy Gillespie 
you listen to things like Salt Peanuts or A Night in Tunisia, and I mean, it, it don't get more Mother Africa than that. People might not be aware <clears throat> because that narrative was not married to that. It was married to American popular music, but American popular music done by people that originally come from Africa and Eastern parts of the world. And, and I guess another artist that I wanted to bring up is Wynton Marsalis. Oh yeah. You know, Wynton Marsalis is somebody that I've always enjoyed talking about. And whenever I've talked about Wynton Marsalis, depending what time in my life you talk to me about him in, my narrative on him changes. My first impression of Wynton Marsalis, he's the stiff, upper-lipped, old, young guy that acts like an old guy, doesn't want to leave a certain musical era, and he's stuck there and doesn't want to grow. That was my impression of him. Then many years later, I realized that he was just not simply cut and dry as that. And then years later after that, I realized that he represented a form of music and a approach to it that was timeless. And I think because of maybe possibly the way he used to express his views and opinions on music, it may have had those warped views of him. But then years later, I realized how valuable he actually really, really is. And I don't really think, and of course, I don't like getting in the heads of other, other men and women. But I, I tend to think now that Wynton Marsalis was not as concerned with staying stuck in an era musically as much as he was keeping a certain grace and dignity, but willing to evolve. You're talking about a jazz musician who's basically rooted in a bebop era, but who's also a classically trained trumpet player. And so he also understands the discipline and the work of music. And suffice to say, make a long story short, I definitely respect Wynton Marsalis at 51 much more than I did than when I was 21 because you get older and when you get older, you think older things. You think more mature man and woman things. And I think that's somebody that a, a lot of people um, may have misunderstood, maybe due to their ignorance, maybe due to his poor expression of his views. But I think he's somebody much more valuable to us than not. And I'm glad that he walked amongst us. Mind you, Bradford Marsalis, his brother, is one funky musician, an incredible musician, and maybe more innovative than Winton. I mean, you're talking about a guy that plays with Public Enemy and uh, DJ Premier and Sting. They just come from a very talented family that all have their individual musical voices. And uh, just happy that we were blessed with the Marsalis family. Ellis, the late great Ellis, who passed away earlier this year. And of course, Winton, the master, and Branford, the funky. And you know, I, I wanna uh, I wanna bring in you know the art of turntablism, you know, and scratching, um, because I think I think I think a lot of people uh, don't realize that that DJing is actually a, an incredible art form unto itself. You know, when you're a master and you're good at it, anybody will respect you doing it. Masters, Terminator X, Grandmaster Flash. Yeah. DJ Lord, so many great musicians. And you know, scratching and even the sampling, there are those that cheapen the culture by just taking a very popular song and looping it and getting somebody to rap over it. And then there's people that take music that people forgot about, or they take music that people know and take other aspects about it that we don't really pay attention to right. and create this new art form from it. Yes. Producers like Prince Paul, known for his work with De La Soul and Stetson Sonic. The Bomb Squad being behind the sounds of people like Public Enemy, Terminator X, Son of Berserk, um, Eric Sermon from EPMD, DJ Premier from Gangstar, who's produced everyone from Jeru the Damager to Christina Aguilera. When you're talking the tops of that art form, you're talking about people on par 
with the best musicians on the planet. Are they musicians? Yeah, they're musicians. They're making music. Right. It, it's just that people have decided to not call a turntable an instrument. Well, originally, it was not. Turntable is where we play the art form on. But the innovations of the African American have always been as such that they will do something that nobody else will even even think to do. And so when Richard Nixon's administration came in, in the late 60s and early 70s, and all these arts programs were cut, and music programs were cut out of schools, mainly inner city schools, where Black and Latino students made the majority of Black people, again, in that African-American tradition, found a way to make music from nothing, to make music from music that's already existing, but making it new and something else. That is actually an incredible feat. And for those that don't want to regard hip hop as a legitimate, great form of music, they really do not understand what it is that they're missing and really need to dwell deeper into it and understand it and study it more. Well, and you know, and I, I have a question for you. So, and, and I think mm -hmm. you could comment on this. Um, you know, like people, like people that are sort of like white people playing hip hop, like, you know, um, or, or for example, white rappers who, who, who you know, who, who do hip hop. It, would you consider that cultural appropriation or, or is, or is hip hop like jazz? It's, it's a concept, it's an art form, you know, it's, it's open to everyone. I think that anybody doing something that was created not by a person because you got to understand it's a jazz is jazz is black music yeah. hip-hop is black music but it wasn't music that was created by a black person there's not a black person that created hip-hop there's not a black person that created jazz <clears throat> black people created these forms of music out of necessity out of their current existence, out of their history, out of their joy, out of their pain, out of spirituality, out of sexuality, out of every aspect in, of life that a person experiences, of, of human experience, um, was created out of that. I believe that anybody that does an art form of music that they are not part of the people that created it is welcome to it. Is it cultural appropriation? Yes, it's cultural appropriation, but I don't think that cultural appropriation necessarily needs to be a negative thing. I think that when you appropriate a culture that's not your own, that you were not part of something or a people that created it, I think based on the respect that you give it, but more importantly, based on the respect that you give the people that give it, you can take the concept of cultural appropriation and make it a good thing. It's just like thievery, right? You could be a thief, like, um, well, let me be careful what I say, but you could be a thief just like a common thief, or you can be Robin Hood, a thief that robs from the rich and gives to the poor. In other words, you can be a good thief or you can be a bad thief. Right, like in the same, the same vein as like white hat hackers and black hat hackers. Right. So you could be a, 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 um, a person that, cre that, that is part of a positive cultural appropriation or part of a negative uh, cultural appropriation. Is it cultural appropriation? Absolutely, because it's not simply just playing a form of music. You're playing a form of music that was created out of somebody's experience and life. But depending on how you show respect to that culture and to the people that created it determines whether or not you're doing it in a negative way or in a positive way. Right. Um, there are white rappers that have positively appropriated hip-hop culture and there are those that appropriated it negatively right. we found old tapes of eminem using the n-word before he was a star on a hip-hop tape referencing uh, an old black girlfriend of his so he's doing a black art form 
that her people created and yet using a racial epithet in the song. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, I mean, that's so controversial, you know, because I mean, yeah, it's just I don't I don't understand. I don't understand how how he could how he could do that, you know, in, in yeah, that just third base. Third base was the same thing. I was watching an interview last night. I had saw it before with uh, MC Search. I rewatched it yesterday from third base where when they came out with their song, The Gas Face, they made references to MC Hammer. Now I'm figuring here's these, uh, these two, two guys, two white Jewish guys from New York doing hip hop, hanging out at the Latin Quarter and on Dev Jam, befriending people like Public Enemy and Run DMC. And yet they're making fun of and, and, and dissing another black hip hop artist simply because they feel that they have the right to. And to me, they don't have the right to because they're being welcomed into the house of hip hop, an art form created by African-Americans out of necessity to create new music when there was no other way to be able to create music because of the above circumstances that I mentioned with funding and musical education in the late 60s, early 70s. And yet they found it. So then eventually um, there's the whole story that MC Hammer had put a, a hit on them for $50,000. They were approached with guns. They had to flee for their lives. So, you know, you're doing this sort of thing and you're not anticipating what may happen out of that, you know? I think that people are welcome and free to love, appreciate, and even practice culture, arts and culture from people other than themselves. And I think that how they go about it, if it's done in a positive way, will be appreciated by everybody. Yes. And I really think that that's how it is a cultural appropriation. You can't get away from that. It absolutely is. A white jazz musician is no different than a white hip hop artist. They're both black forms of music and art. Um, but it all depends what they do with it. Right. And, and I mean, it all depends what they do with it. And, and, and that's the that's the important aspect, right? Right. And and you know the other thing that I think about is like you know people people who who have like for example um, you know um, First Nations people you know uh, like if there's a First Nations artist that 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 is doing hip hop for example that to me like because First Nations people are marginalized people in the same way that. Uh, you know, in the same vein as, as the black, uh, you know, community. And in the same way as like, for example, you know, uh, the, the British had, had uh, you know, colonized Africa, they also colonized India. Right. Know? So in that sense, like, like the, the people that were colonized, the people that, that had their culture erased, you know, right. or, or not erased, but they tried to erase it, you know, um, then, then at the end of the day, you know, we have to realize that, that, that all of these art forms that come from marginalized people, they have, right. a cer they have a certain, you need to respect them a certain way because you understand that, that these things actually are, are not, not only the product of necessity, but they're, they're an expression of, of the identity, which, which. Right. So if you're, if you're an indigenous hip hop, if you're an indigenous hip hop artist, that's cool, but don't be prejudiced against black people. Exactly. Right? Yeah. If you're, if you're an Asian rock and roll star, cool, but don't be prejudiced against black people. That's right. Right. I mean, it's 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 a mutual respect kind of thing. And and believe it or not, that does exist. I mean, believe it or not, people that have been marginalized and people of color that have been colonized all over the world still have prejudice, prejudices amongst each other, which is really fucked up. Like, I, yeah, you know, it's, it's like the, it's like the whole caste system in India. Yeah. You know, you know I, I, I was shocked when I saw the movie Mississippi Masala in the 90s with Denzel Washington, and I realized that the whole thing of light skin and dark skin is an issue in Indian culture like it is in black culture. I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea that, you know, there's a whole dark skin, brown skin, light skin thing. So if it exists within a culture, imagine how it exists amongst other cultures, so to speak. That's right. And it's, it's a matter of, of, of people respecting and loving each other, and especially if you are making a living practicing someone else's culture, it just doesn't mean that you love and respect that culture. It means that you love and respect those people as well. Yes. Yes. And, and you can't dichotomize the, the, the people and the culture because really the, the, the culture comes from the people. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Have you heard about the, the artist Scratch Bastard? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's just, that's all a product of the 90s. Right. You know, I, I was saying that on my CBC radio show yesterday and last week, that post-1990s, we saw an exchange between different ethnicities and cultures, musical styles, genres, this colorless world, this genreless world. Well, we're not there yet, but we might be there musically. We don't live in a world where everybody loves each other. We all know that. But I think from a musician's and artist's point of view, I think you have less of that because musicians don't see other people in regards to race or ethnicity or culture. They see them in regards to musicians. Right. There's a lot of that. And um, a lot of great things came out of that. Kit Koala, who came out of Montreal, you know, who's a, a, a Filipino and became one of the greatest turntablists. I mean, a lot of these artists came out of that whole hybrid of the 1990s of just blurring the lines between musical styles and culture. And I think that's the wonderful thing about music is that we become overcome. You know, I think Karis once said, the one thing about hip hop, it's become a race. He said, when it comes to hip hop culture all over the world, people identify as black, white, German, or Puerto Rican, they say, I'm hip hop. Eminem, when he first came out, was embraced by black people based on his incredible lyricism. It wasn't a white guy rapping. It's like, yo, dude is dope. And um, we see that amongst musicians. Um, and I think it's incredible. I think it's just incredible that we can think like that. Maybe the rest of the world should think like musicians do. <laughs> yes, I, I, think, I think it would be a nicer world for sure. We judge people on whether or not they have chops. Yeah, exactly. Not on what color they are. Yes, yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But then again, I guess the people that didn't have chops would feel discriminated against, right? <laughs> yeah, then it, it would be like, it would, it would be like, it would be the, the world where the, the people that didn't have chops would suddenly be the marginalized people. Right. All these people that are not good, in, are not good musicians. I feel so oppressed. <laughs> And actually, you know, um, speaking of turntablism, people have started getting very experimental with it. There's a Japanese noise artist who uses symbols uh, instead of records on his on his turntable. He, what? Yeah, he, he uses the needle to, to, to play symbols. I have to hear that. I'll send you a link. It's crazy. Yeah, send, send me a, or so or maybe maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. Yeah, I'll listen to it. I'll listen to any old thing. It'll it'll. Uh, it, I mean, is it gonna hurt my teeth? No, it won't hurt your teeth. But it Is it going to sound like nails on a chalkboard? <laughs> yeah, it's quite similar, actually. You, oh, you, you want to make sure that you don't listen to it at full volume because it'll, it'll hurt your ears. Noise artists, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's people that, that make noise. I mean, actually, I, I've been experimenting with, with noise and harsh noise for a long time and also field recordings, you know? Like, I'll make recordings of airports, uh, you know, of, of water, insects, cities you know i'll make i'll make these recordings that that are are not in any way shape or form conventional you know they're, they're like they're, they're like why would anyone why would anyone listen to the sound of an airport you, you might ask but uh, i mean i find it right now i'd love to listen to the sound of an airport because i'd love to imagine being on an airplane going to daytona or somewhere nice or paris or india or the bahamas <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly maybe the sound of an airport is not so bad right about now yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So actually, you'd be surprised. Noise, noise music is actually a, a, a growing genre. A lot of a lot of people are are, are interested in, in 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 things that that you know are considered noise or even harsh noise. Maybe it reminds them of things. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, absolutely. Now I think of the Beatles' Revolution Number no. Nine from the White Album. John Lennon and Yoko Ono experimenting with all these sounds, and over and over, you keep hearing number nine, number and nine. You know what? Uh, there was this video of Yoko Ono screaming into a microphone at a at a music. Yeah, I know. I've and seen I was that. like, and you know, and you know what I thought? I was like, if literally anybody else did that, they would have carted them away, locked them in a mental institution, and 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 thrown the key away. But because it was Yoko Ono, they paid her probably a million dollars to do that. <laughs> Either that or the drugs were responsible, one or the other. Yeah, that's right. 
Yeah, like like she uh, like who knows? She must have been tripping on like LSD or mushrooms or something. Oh my god. Yeah, a lot of people didn't know what to make with a lot of the experimentation that um Yoko and John were doing in the early 70s. They did some they did some great music together. They did some very strange music too. Yeah. Yeah. Number 9. Number 9. Number nine. <laughs> for nine minutes number nine who, who who knows what it means you know like like it was his favorite number and it was related to like his birthday um number nine has always been prevalent in his life right right and i heard that there are in different religions uh spiritual aspects to number nine and number six and mm -hmm. things like that so who knows yeah seven also yeah. seven is also a very spiritual number in different beliefs Yes, and then you put the numbers six and nine together and suddenly you have a whole nother meaning. There you go, 69. <laughs> you, you ever hear what a 68 is? No, I, I, I don't know. 68 is a 68 and I owe you one. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, so obviously... Um, you know the music scene in Canada is quite interesting, and and we we do have a we do have a, a hip hop star that I think I think is definitely, um, you know like like Drake. You know Drake is uh, I guess Canada's biggest hip hop export. You know, uh, yeah. in a, in a certain way. You know, um, uh, and and it's just quite interesting that he 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 built this gigantic mansion. You know, in Toronto, and uh, and for this mansion he he had a piano built. Uh, by this company Busendorfer, and and he had it dec decorated by a Japanese artist, and it's like it's a gorgeous piano. You Can know? he play? I have no idea. Or do you just want to have a piano in his house, like you know? Dude, I you know I asked myself that question. Like, if you're gonna spend you know five hundred thousand dollars on a piano, at least you could play a couple of things. I mean, because I know a lot of rich people got pianos in their homes and can't play. Mary had a little lamb. Yeah, I know. It's just you know you gotta have a piano. For sure. The one thing I'll say about Drake, and he's a perfect example of an artist that doesn't fit a genre. You can't call him a hip hop artist. You could. You can't call him an R&B artist, but in a way you could. You can't call him a pop artist, but yeah, he's the biggest pop star on the planet. He's one of those artists that left where it was that he came from, I guess, appearing on those Little Wayne mixtapes to being somebody whose music doesn't really have as much as a genre as it is, it's Drake music. And now how many people sound like Drake now? and do the Drake thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. A lot of the songs he's singing. Mind you, he's using auto-tune, but he's singing. Hip-hop is about rapping. So is it about him? You know, Drake just does Drake. And hundreds of millions of people around the world love what, what it is that Drake does. Yeah. And I'm very happy for him. Yeah. Do you, do you, know, do you know that group uh, Pentatonix? Uh, no. Okay, they're they're an a cappella group and and um, and uh, and like you know I guess I guess this comes from choirs and of course uh, as as we know like gospel and and singing in a choir you know is is part of a rich tradition. You know? Absolutely. And actually, one of my, one of my favorite artists, one of my heroes, uh, is Brian Eno. And Brian, oh yeah. And Brian Eno thinks that that gospel singing and and church singing, uh, you know, like like of that tradition is is really profound. That's the criteria right there. That's the criteria. If you can sing, can you sing gospel? Can you do what Mavis Staples does? Can you do what Aretha Franklin does? All the greatest singers all start out in gospel because gospel is not just about singing. It's about feeling. Yes. Gospel singers just don't sing a song. They feel it. Yes. They testify to it. They have a spiritual experience, an out-of-body experience. And, you know, I've, I've done some shows and some lectures on this, what a lot of people don't understand, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but sexuality is a big part of the church experience. I mean, it really is. I mean, if you take, for instance, just the minister alone in the history of, of the church, a lot of ministers look like pimps. I mean, who is more dap and more sharply dressed and has his hair done better and shoes and has a nicer car than your local minister? And, you know, that's what soul music is. Soul music is where the sacred meets the sensual. And there's something very sexual about the church experience. Very sexual about it. I mean, you watch Al Green on stage or you watch him in the church. It's the same thing. It's the same experience. Mm -hmm. 
sexuality is a big part of the African-American spiritual experience. And I think it's also a big part of the African spiritual experience. Some people get offended when you say that. Well, what they need to do is they need to read and study and observe and, and watch. And it's weird because like, you know, in Indian, in Indian movies, right, they, they didn't even allow kissing for the longest time, but the Karma Sutra is, is written, it was made in India. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? The greatest, most outlandish sexual experiences and positions were created in India, but we can't show people kissing on TV. <laughs> it's like, how stupid is that? That's wow. You know? Yeah. And speaking, speaking. But if you that, study a lot of Indian spirituality, mm -hmm. sexuality is a big part of it. It is. It is. Tantric sex, yeah. sexual healing and magic and all that sort of stuff. It's a big part of it. Spiritual, um, you know, uh, 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 awakenings yes. are found through sexuality in Indian spirituality. Absolutely. Absolutely. No. But don't let them kiss on TV. <laughs> I, you, you know, you just wonder, you wonder, like, like pe people are so strange, you know, they don't realize that their culture is like, is so rich and so, you know, diverse in this area. And suddenly they're like, oh, you can't kiss on TV. It's like. That's where the politics get involved. That's all political. Yeah. Yeah. That's politics. Yeah. And, and is it possible for any artist to be apolitical? Do you think? Sure. Um, you know what somebody chooses to do is, is, is on them. Right. But until recently where the demand for it became almost impossible to, you know, resist today, people will tell you something if you're not political and they won't accept what it is that you do artistically. If you don't have something to say, right. If you don't have an alliance or an allegiance of some, right. But yet the problems of the world, are not new. They've always been here. And from until recently, till going back to the late 1960s, many artists have been apolitical. Just dance. Just dance, write a song about falling in love, that girl, I love that girl, I love that guy. Doesn't matter that the world's falling to pieces, you know? So for the longest time, people were apolitical. The Beatles were apolitical for the first few years of their superstardom. Right. Ryan Epstein told him, when you go to the United States, don't talk about politics, don't talk about the Vietnam War. And again, you know, John Lennon had to open his mouth. <laughs> but then people like George Harrison became very political. You know, he's got the album, the album, the concert for Bangladesh. And then you have people like Bob Geldof, who organized the Live Aid and, you know, Band Aid, We Are the World. Very political artists like Prince and Michael Jackson and Bob Dylan. But there are many artists that uh, for so many years didn't want to talk about things going on in the world. Right. You too was very political, but in excess was not. Um, <coughs> Stevie Wonder was very political, but Madonna was not. You know? So yeah, it is possible people did it. But the one thing that I've always read throughout history is that the revolution always starts with the poets and the artists. Yes. Throughout history, I've read that. So therefore, the arts and politics and the sociology, and you know, I won't even, I'll take back the word politics because some people are offended by that word. So let's just call it the sociology of what's going on in the world. Right. So and, and if, um, you look at, if you look at it from an anthropological perspective, I mean, I mean, art, art and, 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 and music are so incredibly, I mean, inextricably tied to, 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 you know, to all these things, whether, whether, you know, whether, whether it's culture, whether it's politics, whether it's history, you know, we can't, we can't, we can't, uh, we can't, we can't really understand a culture or a time period right. without understanding its musical and artistic lineage and traditions. You, you can't, you know, because like, whether Absolutely. it's, wh whether it's won't a, remember you. Whether, whether, whether it's a cave painting or, or, you know, whether, whether it's a pot, you know, uh, that, 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 that you find in the ground, you know, these, these are the art forms that, that really tell us what the people were up to and what they were thinking. Well, you, you won't be remembered if you never had something to say about your times. Exactly. You just won't be remembered. We won't remember the temptations from my girl. We'll remember them for Papa was a rolling stone. 
you know? Um, yeah, we might remember James Brown for I Feel Good, but most black people remember him for Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, you know? Because that's, that's, that's what really, that's really what, uh, what stood out. That, right. That, that's and that. it meant something. It meant something and affected right. change. Right. Um, yeah. Public Enemy has Flavor Flav joke songs, but we remember them for Fight the Power. So you don't have to be political. You can choose not to be. Many people have gotten away from it, but that will also determine your legacy as far as an artist and how you encapsulated your times in your work. And if you ever had something to say about the world going on around you. Yeah. A lot of people don't want to get involved. Yeah. Well, you don't, you don't have to, but we may be living in an era right now that if you're not, people might not be interested in your music. Yeah. Yeah. We're at a pressure point. The world was always bad. And it was always strife and oppression going on in the world. But we seem to be at a pressure point. And that pressure point amongst this young generation wants you to hear, wants to hear you say something or just they'd rather you shut up if you don't. Yeah. If you don't have something to say, they'd rather just not hear anything. Right. And I think that's where we're at. But we, but we also, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, but we also live in, we also live in the world of Instagram videos and, and, you know, and, and, you know, and all the fake videos and all the, you know, all the, uh, you know, all the basic stuff that, that people show, you know, like, I, I would say we, we live in, a, in an era where, where we have access to the most amount of information and knowledge, you know, that we've ever had, but people still spend their time watching cat videos and dog videos on Instagram. So, you know, uh, like... If, You're right, but you just made me think of something. You just gave me an, a, a, an epiphany about something. <clears throat> I just thought of it now, based on what you just told me. You know, everyone's making these Instagram and, and TikTok videos and, and all this stuff. And... Um, but you see, with that, you also have people that are unknown. Some people that possess very little talent will create these, these uh, uh, webcasts and videos where they're talking about the states of the world. So if your next door neighbor has got thousands of viewers watching him online because he's talking about the state of the world, you virtually leave it impossible for a well-known artist to get away without saying something. So in a way, it does help us. That technology helps us. There are people that have become celebrities <clears throat> with very little talent, not even broadcasting experience or talent, but by creating these webcasts where they talk about what's going on in the world and people relate to them because people, I guess, find their views or some of their findings interesting enough to want to tune in every day or whenever they're on. Right. So you're telling me your next door neighbor who works at a McDonald's as a cashier during the day, but as a webcast at night that has 25,000 viewers all intently listening to what he's talking about, how do you now as whoever you are not have something profound to say? You're gonna need something profound to say because even the McDonald's cashier comes home at night, turns on his laptop and has something profound to say. Right, right. So, you just made me think of that now, that technology and that culture is forcing people to think about some of the more vital things in life Definitely. than maybe they were previously used to. Yes, yes. Well, and, and you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's great. It's great that the technology has opened these doors because, you know, it's, it's, it's made, it's, dem it's, democrat it's democratized the, uh, you know, the making of art, the making of, 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 of journalism. You know, and, and like in a way, it's a good thing and a bad thing because in the olden times, you know, when you made music, it had to go through a record label. That was the funnel. You know, if you, right. if you were doing media, it had to come from television or radio. But today, anybody with a cell phone can make can make something, and and it next thing you know, it's it's gone viral. You know, right. And 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 millions of people, if not billions of people, uh, you know, have suddenly seen this thing. You know, this little home video that you shot in your backyard. You know, so absolutely. You know. So Absolutely. I, I, it has its uses. It has its uses and it's, it's definitely, it's definitely a valuable tool if you know how yeah. to use it. It could definitely be utilized to do more good than harm, depending on the free will of the people and what they choose to do with it. Yes. Yes. Well, and, and, you know, I mean, like 
this this brings me to another topic you know like because after the sexual revolution you know and after like i mean like somebody like prince you know like i mean his sexuality like he was so bold in the way that he expressed himself you know like he would he would wear blouses he would wear high heels he would wear makeup you know and 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 so uh you, you know i mean being being a queer artist in today's time you know it's it's so much easier for for a queer artist to to express themselves and to you know to be able to you know even if you know even if if in the olden days they wouldn't be able to be uh as open about it today being open about your sexuality being open about your political statements being open about your religious uh you know statements like people are people are allowed to express themselves now they can they can they can be and say whoever they want and unfortunately that's also led to people like trump getting to the power you know uh, but at the same time, it's also been incredibly useful and incredibly, uh, you know, um, empowering for people for people that wanted to that wanted to express themselves and in other in 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 another time would have never been given the platform. You know. Well, let me ask you: If you were to walk in a room, and there's a deadly cobra in the room, and there's no lights on, would you rather know in advance, or would you rather be surprised? Hmm. You'd rather know in advance because then you could act accordingly. You could decide, I'm not entering that room. Or I'm going to enter that room, but maybe with a shotgun, right? Right. People expressing how they really feel, good or bad, is still a more positive thing because at least you know what people, right. what you're dealing with. At least, it's, at least it's on the table. Right. You know, Malcolm, and I'm not slamming Democrats or slamming Republicans, but Malcolm X used to say in the 60s, he admired Republicans and conservatives more because they told you how they really felt. And he said Democrats felt the same way, but their public stance was to not feel the same way. But he says at the end of the day, they felt the same way that conservatives did. He says, I'd rather you be an enemy to my face than an enemy behind my back. Right. And I think that we're living in an era where people are feeling more and more comfortable to express how they feel. Yeah. It's not always positive. Yes. But at least we kind of know who's who a little bit better now. Right, and and like people people that are like for example people that 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 hold views that are you know that are considered bigotry, you know they 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 feel more comfortable with being public about that. And like you said, would would you rather? I I mean I would obviously rather know that that there was a cobra in the room before I went into the room. So, right. So so I think you're right. Having it have it having it be on the table is much, much better than, than having it, you know. If you're a bigot, I'd rather know in advance because I'll know not to come chill with you. That's right. That's right. That's right. We're living in a, in, a, in a time that is unique, unlike any other time that we've lived in. There are some things that can remind us of the 70s. There are some things that might remind us of the 70s. But those are elements. For the most part, this is a brand new time, a very unique time. Um, and we're seeing a uh, generation that was almost born with no innocence that have the greatest bullshit detectors you can imagine. This present generation does not necessarily have the answers to everything or know what's right, but they seem to have a good grasp on what's wrong. And that's a starting point. That's a starting and point. that's a very big starting point because what it means is we don't know the ingredients to prepare the perfect meal right now, but we certainly know what ingredients are poison and we can get rid of them right off the bat. Right. We're not sure what seasoning is going to make this meal taste really great, yeah. but we know that, 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 and that is really not good. So we can get rid of those ingredients right from the get go. Right. And that's more than a good start. That's uh, that's half the battle. <laughs> yeah no i have to agree with you that's that's uh, that's exactly correct yeah let's have the battle Well, this this has been a remarkable uh, exchange, and and I, I I I'm honored that you know that you took the time to you know to to talk with me and 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 uh, and to have this wide ranging ranging conversation. This is why I started the podcast to have these kinds of conversations. 
Brother Afraz, it was a, a, a pleasure and an honor to have been uh, joined by you today and to uh, be able to talk about these things. And I really think it's a gentleman like yourself, both as a person, as a man, and as an artist, who are leading the direction to art and music that means something, but that also people that create art and music bring about change in the world. Because that's the greatest thing. Music sounds good to the ears, can sound good to your feet, can sound good to your hands, but music sounds best when it's actually making the world a better place. Yes, when it touches the heart. Yeah, and I think it's uh, individuals like yourself that are gonna usher that in. So I wanna thank you for having me on today. The privilege <laughs> was all mine. Thank you so much. I, I, yeah, and, and I'll, let you, I'll let you know as soon as it's uh, as the, um, is uploaded onto YouTube. I'll, I'll send you the Good, link. and I'll promo it on Facebook. All right, Brother Afraz, you have yourself a great day. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed this. Okay. Take care. Take Bye. care, man. Take care, my friend.